up, we have is Dr. David Anders. He's the host of our wonderful radio program called Call to Communion. And Dr. Anders brings a scholarly approach to his instruction on the Catholic Church. Born in a devout Protestant family, he developed a deep respect for the Bible. He attended a Protestant college and seminary, earning a PhD in Reformation history and historical theology. During those studies, he was persuaded by the truth of the Catholic faith and converted to Catholicism. On his very popular engaging call-in show, it's on every day, Monday through Friday, he answers challenging questions on matters of faith and church teaching. And his whole show is a challenge, which is basically, why aren't you Catholic? What's keeping you from becoming Catholic? Those are the questions and obstacles that he takes on every day on his program. We also air once a week a television version of one of the broadcasts with him. And I don't want to forget that Tom Price, who our radio program director, is his co-host and a wonderful co-host. I wanted to mention that. Also, he's got a wonderful book on marriage that's available at our religious catalog. He's got a new book coming up having to do more with apologetics coming up uh, after Christmas. People can look for that from our wonderful new division, EWTN Publishing. And just remember, you know, in a lot of ways, he was called to be Catholic, and now he's called to Denver, and he's called to speak to you. Welcome, Dr. David Anders. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be with you today. I, uh, I love Denver. I've been here before. It's a wonderful city, and you've got a lot of fantastic Catholics here. So it's a great place to come talk about Jesus. So when they asked me if I would like to come, I said, well, what am I supposed to talk about? And they said, well, the theme of the conference is faith can move mountains. So I thought it'd be appropriate to begin with the words of our Lord in the gospel from which that phrase is derived. Jesus says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, our Lord's words would perhaps make you think that the point of the faith was to move objects from here to there. And if someone said they wanted to become Catholic or have faith because they wanted to, you know, get involved in supernatural excavation, we might think it was kind of a childish approach to faith. You know, kids, kids can do this kind of thing. I remember when my, my fourth son was about, oh, a little kid, eight or nine years old, there was a toy that he really wanted to have. It was a Lego. And I was done buying Legos. I've got plenty, trust me. And I'm like, you want this one? You're going to pay for it yourself. Well, he didn't have any money. So he persuades his older brother to drive him to the toy store. And he says, I am going to pray that God will give me the money I need to buy this toy. It was about 20 bucks after taxes. And so they get in the car and the older brother says, the kid's name is Justin. He says, Justin, this is very naive and childish of you. This is not how faith works. That's not how God works. It's not why we have faith. And Justin says, no matter, I'm going to the store, drive me. So they pull into the parking lot, they park the car, Justin opens the car door, looks down, and there's a $20 bill on the ground. <laughs> it's a true story. We, we still get a kick out of that. And that story came back to me recently because in my own devotions, I've, I've been going back to the lives of the saints again more in my own life, and I was reading the life of St. Dominic, founder of the Dominican Order. And you may remember, if you know the life of St. Dominic, there's a story where Dominic needs to cross a river, and he shows up at the river, and the ferryman refuses to take him over because he doesn't have the money for the toll. And Dominic says, no problem. He prays, looks down on the ground, and there's the exact amount of the toll. My son's middle name is Dominic, by the way. <laughs> so God sometimes does this kind of thing. You know, in the church that I grew up in, the pastor was a man of faith, and he had one time uh, kind of a mountain on the property of the church. They needed to clear that away and build a parking lot. This is a true story, but he didn't have the money, 
to clear away the dirt. So he said, well, Jesus said, if I command the mountain to be moved, it'll move. So he goes out every day and says, I command you in the name of Jesus to be moved from my parking lot. He keeps that up for a while. A few weeks later, a guy comes to the door and says, I'm a contractor. We're building this building over here. We've got a, a hole. We need some fill dirt. Your mountain fits our hole. Can we take it away? And, you know, you don't have to hang out very long at EWTN before you hear a lot of these kinds of stories from the life of Mother Angelica. I mean, who would have thought you could build a Catholic radio network in Birmingham, Alabama, of all places, the most Protestant city in the entire world, I think, right? And, uh, and yet she had some miraculous answers to prayer, like the time that St. Michael showed her where to put the shortwave tower in Vandiver when all of the engineers said it'll never work. And according to Tom, my co-host, who knows these kinds of things, he says it's the best shortwave signal you could possibly get. Nobody knows why it works, except Mother Angelica and St. Michael. <laughs> so miracles like this clearly build our faith. And if you read the commentaries of the church fathers on this text, they took it very seriously that we might expect that God could move objects from here to there. And that builds our faith. But is that, after all, why we have faith? I mean, do we get faith? We desire faith so we can move objects from here to there. After all, Abraham, our father in faith, left a culture that was very masterful at moving objects. Right? Remember the story of the Tower of Babel? That's really a symbol for the power of technology, moving objects from here to there. Um, but he left for a spiritual promise that seemed, quite frankly, beyond hope. And that promise was what God pronounced to him, I will be your God. I will be your God. Hebrews 11, the great chapter on faith, cites the example of many men of faith who never received what was promised. And for a Catholic, the faith seems more often to come with suffering than with the power to move material objects or power over the material world. And finally, St. Paul himself tells us outright, if you have faith that moves mountains, but you have not love, you are nothing. So the value and the purpose of faith is not primarily that we can move objects locally from place to place. What then is the good of faith? Why should we desire faith for ourselves or for our children? Many of you may remember a prominent atheist writer and critic of religion who died a few years back named Christopher Hitchens. He really hated religion and he went around the world kind of attacking it and writing books about it. And he loved to challenge believers to debate. And in those debates, he would ask a question that he thought was kind of a, a stumper. And the question was, what good can a believer do that an unbeliever cannot do? You build a hospital, I can build a hospital. You teach a kid to read, I can teach a kid to read. You feed the poor, I feed the poor. Now, he didn't stop to question how parasitic that question was on Christianity, because before the Catholic Church, who was out there building hospitals and educating the poor and feeding the hungry? Nobody. That was the Catholic Church that started that, right? But he didn't think about that. But what good could you do? What does your faith add to the picture, he wanted to ask? And interesting answer to that was given by a Protestant minister he debated one time. He said, what can a believer do that an unbeliever can't do? The guy shot back and said, tithe. But the better answer, I think, comes from one of my favorite saints, St. Saint Josephine Bakita, lived from 1869 to 1947. You know St. Josephine Bakita. She was born in the Sudan, southern Sudan, captured into slavery at a young age, so young she did not actually know her birth name. The name Bakita was kind of a joke that her abusers gave her. It meant lucky because she was anything but lucky. Had a horrible life. But she tells us in her autobiography that she would go out, even in that stage of her life, she would see the sun, moon, and stars. And she said to herself, who could be the master of these beautiful things? And I felt, she says, a great desire to see him, to know him, and to pay him homage. 
Notice the desire of her heart. It is a contemplative longing with no practical aim whatsoever. The desire to know God and to pay him homage. The desire written into all of our hearts. What happened when she found the faith? An Italian diplomat redeemed her from slavery, introduced her to the Catholic Church, and of course she died a Catholic religious. And this is the verdict that she pronounced on her own life. I am definitively loved. And whatever happens to me, I am awaited by this love. And so my life is good. Could Christopher Hitchens ever pronounce the verdict that the life of Josephine Bakita was good? Most certainly he could not. He would only have been able to see a life filled with suffering. Moreover, she says, if I were to meet those who kidnapped me and even those who tortured me, I would kneel and kiss their hands. For if these things had not happened, I would not have been a Christian and a religious today. For Bikita, the Catholic faith offered transcendent hope. And the verdict that her life was good and a reason to bear suffering and the strength to forgive. Things that Christopher Hitchens could never have provided. Now consider, faith of this sort can only be received. It could never be imposed. And it must be received from without. We cannot invent it for ourselves or else it would not be transcendent. The very thought of inventing my own meaning makes no sense because if I invent it, then it doesn't transcend me, you see. For it to be transcendent, it has to come from without. For five years, I've been privileged to work in Catholic radio on the show called To Communion, which tries to help non-Catholics overcome their objections to Catholic faith. And I really want to help them come to believe that what the church says is true, not because the faith will help them to move objects or to obtain money or cures, or to have insight into the placement of radio towers, although that seems to happen sometimes. I hope they have faith because it has the potential to change who they are, to see themselves in the world in a new light, to qualify everything they do ultimately in charity uniting them to God. And we don't seek to impose this faith, we could never do that anyway, but to give reasons for the hope that is in us and to invite people to come share in relationship to Christ in the Catholic Church. Is there a need for this faith in the world today? I wanna tell you another story. This one struck me when I read about it in the newspapers last year. There was a woman in New York in January, 27 year old nutritionist who committed suicide tragically. Now, unfortunately, many people commit suicide in our country every year, but this one was notable because of how she wrote about it on her website before she died and made a kind of a public spectacle out of it. And the reasons that she gave for her suicide are what I want to draw to your attention. In the aftermath, she, her note made clear that sure, she saw that her life was a good one. It was filled with opportunity with relationships, with experiences, with pleasures and material comforts. Hers was a crisis of meaning that none of it ultimately meant anything. And she said, I have accepted that hope is nothing more than delayed disappointment. And I am plain old fashioned tired of feeling tired. She said, my life looks great on paper, but all of these things seem trivial to me. It is the ultimate first world problem, end of quote. Now this crisis of meaning is not a new thing, but I think it's more pervasive today than, it, than in many past generations, especially for those who were born after 1995, the so-called Generation Z or the iGen, the first generation to grow up with the internet they also have significantly higher rates of depression, of anxiety, of addiction, and suicide. Why might that be? Never before in history have members of a generation been more free to choose their own identity. 
Never before have they had more cultural options presented to them. Almost any cultural form can now be experienced immediately and privately, which is not in itself a bad thing. Never before, however, have choice or freedom for their own sake been shown to be more vacuous. Alongside growing technological and cultural freedom, we've seen the growing conviction that freedom itself must be the ultimate criterion of a good life, not just political freedom, but freedom even from meaning. I remember back in 1992, in the case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Justice Anthony Kennedy really put this cultural viewpoint on the map in that decision when he wrote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. That was the ideology that he promoted in that decision. It's what Pope John Paul II wrote against in the Gospel of Life, his encyclical, warning about a, a kind of freedom that would lead to a culture of death when people realize that life itself can appear to be an imposition on my freedom. You know, I saw, this is true, I saw a headline a little while back that said, man sues his parents for having him without his consent. <laughs> and so John Paul II argued that objective meaning was no farther away than our own bodies, our own sexuality reflecting the objective fact that we're made for one another, for relationship, for the complementarity of men and women. That's what his theology of the body was all about. Even that, even the most obvious meaning inscribed in our very flesh is now called into question. Another story. I was in a local coffee shop in Birmingham a few years back, and I had just read the news that in a particular school district in Nebraska, the teachers were no longer allowed to refer to the children as boys and girls. They had to use a gender neutral term like purple penguins. All purple penguins come to the mat. And I was telling this story to my daughter, who's a very beautiful young woman. While I'm telling it, a woman in front of me in line wearing hospital scrubs turns around with a kind of superior look on her face and explains to me that this is a magnificent policy. And so standing there waiting for the coffee, we get into a discussion about the nature and meaning of human sexuality and male and female and what we can know and not know. And she, all I wanted her to do was to concede that, that men and women exist. And I couldn't get that out of her. So finally, I think I've got the ultimate argument. I point to my daughter, beautiful young woman. And I said, see this? This is my daughter. This is a girl. <laughs> and she says, I don't mean any offense, but I don't know that. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I think your ideology has overrun your intellect. And so what do you do in a culture, in a society, in which every possible freedom is available to you except the freedom of meaning itself? No imposition allowed to define my existence outside of myself. Well, you have no solution to the problem of suffering. Nothing to do with it. You know, I was talking to somebody before I came on stage about the, the growing threat to our cultural coherence and our morality of a, a kind of watered down palliative yoga and Buddhism pervading the culture is kind of a very thin soup sort of spirituality that's basically designed just to alleviate my own psychological angst without any deeper meaning attached to it. You know what I'm talking about. You see it on the covers of magazine covers, you know, when you go to the organic grocery stores everywhere, some serene person in, in yoga pants sitting on a mat, and this image that if you will just spend five minutes a day contemplating your navel, all of your troubles will go away. <laughs> and, a, and a great proponent of this movement is a woman named Sharon Salzberg, promoting mindfulness meditation and this kind of thing. And I listened to her give a talk recently, and she said, it struck me, it's the one thing in her talk that struck me, she said, she said, suffering is not redemptive. It's just suffering. 
That's a dangerous position to take. No meaning whatsoever at all. The only thing to do is withdraw from the world, from your experience, from maybe your moral responsibilities even, and seek a kind of quietistic solace in my own interior, meaningless experience. Another result of this lack of meaning is the rise in divisive ideologies as a substitute for transcendent meaning. Political landscape construed as a battlefield between good and evil and politics taking the place of the transcendent. And we know how that's turning out. It's not very pretty. Of course, the whole thing flows from a bad idea of human freedom. You know where we got the idea of human freedom, where this, where this notion came from as a human good to be pursued? It's really the gift of the Catholic Church to civilization. It's the patrimony of St. Augustine and his theology back in the fourth century when he wrote a book on the freedom of the will as the great good that could be given to us by the grace of Christ. Um, because see, Augustine's position was you're not really free until you're freed up to do good. If you are the slave of sin, you're not really ultimately free. And sometimes I use this illustration, you know, somebody says to me, well, will we be free in heaven? Well, Augustine says we'll be a lot freer in heaven than we are now. How does that work out? Well, imagine, you know, we have this opioid crisis. People get on drugs because they're looking for some way to palliate their pain. Imagine a great artist and you place in front of him a hundred blank canvases and all the painting tools that he could possibly need to create a hundred masterpieces. And you say, go to it. You're completely free to paint whatever you want. And he says, well, as soon as I get off the couch, because I'm too busy taking opioids, right? He's not really free at that point. You free him from his addiction, and suddenly the world of options in front of him of potentially good things that he might do opens up and it's infinite in value. That's true freedom when we're freed of our own concupiscence and our lusts and our pride and our own self-imprisonment brought about by the corruption of sin, only then can we be truly free, free to, for something objectively meaningful, free for the good. And that's why Augustine would say, probably the most famous quote in Catholic history, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. You know, I had my own crisis of meaning earlier in my life, in the late 1990s. I'd grown up in a tradition that taught me that my activity in this life was radically disconnected from any ultimate purpose or meaning. We believed in God, but we thought that no human activity, not moral, not aesthetic, not philosophical, not scientific, could possibly attain him. Our path was the path of faith alone. And of course that freed me from the burdens of moral striving, but it also freed my moral efforts from any ultimate purpose in the activity of my daily life. Two things happened to me that overturned my complacency. And the first was a crisis in my family life. The second was an intellectual crisis. The family crisis was that my marriage began falling apart over the stresses of career and children and the real realization that my wife and I really didn't have a common vision of family life. Furthermore, neither one of us had the virtues that were necessary to put up with one another's rather considerable failings. And suddenly life by faith alone didn't look very appealing. The intellectual crisis arose when I realized that my Protestant faith was not the faith of the Bible or the faith of Christian history, nor could it pass philosophical muster or rational scrutiny. That's what my studies in Christian intellectual history taught me. And our suffering was really quite bad. You know, when you, when you don't have a common meaning, two people who live together will inevitably come into conflict. But when you're aiming at different goods, that conflict can spill over into contempt and criticism and stonewalling and rejection. And I'll never forget the day that my wife looked at me with undisguised contempt and told me that she hated me. And I felt, that's okay, I hate me too, right? And that was how bad it got. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story of how the Catholic Church saved us from that. But it began in a crisis of meaning and a lack of virtue. The suffering was intense. So I myself tried my hand at some of that palliative meditation that's so popular today. And it did have a mildly analgesic effect. But most certainly it did not provide me with the moral impetus that I needed 
What I needed, I learned. What I needed, I eventually would learn, I would find in the Catholic faith. And I knew in my heart of hearts that moral values could not ultimately be vacuous. I knew what the ancients like Plato and Socrates knew, that it is indeed objectively better to suffer injustice than to perpetrate it. But I also knew, like the young St. Augustine, that this is easier said than done. How to make sense of my moral longings, how to find an adequate reason to bear suffering, how to find strength to do this. That's what I found in the Catholic faith. So, as I read Christian history, especially the history of Christian antiquity, this is what I found. What I found was that the heart of the Catholic faith and of Scripture is not a doctrine of salvation by faith alone, but the biblical vision of humanity reborn, remade after Christ's likeness and image. Saint Irenaeus, perhaps the first systematic theologian in the Catholic tradition, second century, wrote this. He said, what we lost in Adam, we regain in Christ, namely, to be in the likeness and image of God. We find this new life demonstrated in Christ himself, the noblest and most morally upright of all people. It's described abstractly in the Sermon on the Mount. St. Augustine explained in his commentary on the sermon that the Beatitudes are not so much commands as promises the gifts of the Holy Spirit that come through faith. That was the promise of the gospel all along. The prophets of old, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, even the book of Deuteronomy say the time is coming when the Lord will make a new covenant with his people, not simply a law written on stone, but one written on human hearts, his spirit dwelling in our hearts so that we might act through a charity that comes to us from the outside as a gift, but given to us to become our very own. We share in this gift, of course, through the sacraments, especially the sacrament of baptism. St. Paul says we die with Christ in baptism and are reborn again with him to new life so that that image and likeness and spirit of Christ that we see exemplified in his holiness and in his sermon is reworked in ourselves, our character being transformed into him. This gift of divine life is what the Eastern fathers of the church, church referred to as theosis or divinization that share in the divine nature that St. Peter writes about in second of his epistles. St. Athanasius' famous quote, God became man that we might become God. Not, of course, you know, God of our own little world or absorbed into his divinity, but that we might be made God-like in our character, share in his image and likeness. This was not the faith that I had grown up with at all. Did you ever wonder in the fourth century, the greatest theological controversy in the church's history was the Arian controversy when a huge section of the Catholic world denied the divinity of Christ. What's the big fuss about? Why, why the mess? St. Athanasius wrote a little book called Discourses Against the Arians that explained why he thought this was such a critical issue, why it was worth fighting for. He explains that a redemption that leaves man in actual sin is no redemption at all. He argued that God could simply have forgiven our sin without imparting that moral renovation. Now that's kind of what Luther taught, right? But that would have been absurd. Athanasius speaks about if we had received grace from without, but not having it united to our very body within, man would not stop sinning. And that after all was the great good of the incarnation that we might be united to his divinity remade in his image and likeness. He would explain why later St. Gregory Nazianzus would insist so and strongly against the Apollinarians that Christ really did assume a true and complete human nature. Why, he said, because whatever has not been assumed has not been healed. You may have heard that famous quotation. And that was the, the end and the goal of the whole Catholic faith to actually heal our humanity through the divinity of Christ, not to leave us in our sins, not simply to forgive us and leave us on our own resources, but to change us and make us new men and women in Christ. When G.K. Chesterton, the famous writer, was asked why he became a Catholic, he gave the most sensible answer you could give. He said, well, to get rid of my sins. For the Catholic Church is the only religion that claims and delivers freedom from sin. Think about how this leads to holiness. I got a call this week on the show. A man called and he said, 
I'm frustrated. Why should I go to confession when I know that I will fall again? Well, the answer I told him is step one is actually believing in faith that it's possible not to fall again. You remember Ignatius of Loyola? Back in 1521, he got his leg blown off by a cannonball. Prior to that, he was a vain, vainglorious, and proud, arrogant man living only for himself. And sitting there recuperating in the hospital bed, he began to read the lives of the saints because they were the only things available to him. And as he was reading, he was struck with the illumination of faith. And he said to himself, why couldn't I do what they did? Why couldn't I do what they did? That's what faith gives you, the confidence that God will come to you and help you in what otherwise seems impossible. And of course, St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, to grow in Christ, we have to purify ourselves of every impurity of flesh and spirit. So St. Ignatius turned around, wrote a book about it called The Spiritual Exercises, right? How to purify yourself of every impurity of flesh and spirit. The same thing became famous, of course, throughout the Christian world. The same thing happened to St. Augustine. He was completely stuck in a rut. He was the most brilliant philosopher and theologian, knew a lot about God, but he couldn't actually live the truth that philosophy delivered because of his concupiscence. Then he learned about Anthony of the desert, a simple unlettered man who abandoned everything to follow Christ and holiness of life and of the other desert fathers. And, and Augustine tells us this story when he learned about Anthony and the desert fathers, he says, what is the matter with us, we scholars, we philosopher types? What is the meaning of this story? These men have not had our schooling, and yet they stand up and storm the gates of heaven, while Eve, we, for all of our learning, lie here groveling in this world of flesh and blood. And he saw, delivered in the promise of Christ, what the best philosophers of the world could never give him, and that is a will actually healed from sin. You know, I was contacted by an investment banker oh, about a year ago who, like me, had grown up in a tradition that separated faith and morality, but he found himself also longing for holiness. And he said to me, do you really think that the church and her sacraments are the answer to that need? Uh, y yes. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, was, I received a call one time from a Satanist, ex-Satanist. He said, you know, Satanists develop some pretty bad habits. I would think so, right, wouldn't you? <laughs> and he says, I want to follow God now, but it's hard for me to rid myself of my sins. Can the Catholic faith help me? Well, the lives of the saints say yes. Abbot Moses, Moses the Black, great desert father, uh, one of the ones that John Cashin interviewed in his conferences with the desert fathers, he goes to Abbot Moses one day, they're talking and Abbot says to John Cashin, he says, uh, so why do you think we do what we do? All this fasting and praying and abstinence and penances and so forth, and Cashin says, I would get to heaven. And Abbot Moses says, yeah, that's the ultimate goal, but what's like the proximate goal? What, what are we trying to accomplish right here and now? And Cashin says, beats me, I don't know, what are you trying to do? Abbot Moses says, purity of heart, without which no one can see God. Can the faith actually deliver that purity of heart? Can, well, the scripture says yes, it speaks of the Gentiles, whose hearts God purified by faith. I'll tell you a story about faith, the power of faith to purify the heart. A friend of mine, when I became Catholic, he said, That's, I'm done with Anders. I'm never talking to him about religion again. He's crazy. You know, nobody in Alabama becomes Catholic. That's just nuts. But he didn't write me off as a friend. So we, you know, stay in touch. We talk from time to time, share stories about our lives and our families. And uh, after about seven years, he realizes I'm not being fair to Anders. I need to let him talk about his faith. So we start talking religion again. He's a Protestant fellow. And I said, uh, you're Protestant. He says, that's right. I said, you believe in Bible alone? He says, that's right. So let me ask you a question. How do you know the difference between a dogma and an opinion? He says, what do you mean? He said, dogma? 
all Christians have to believe it, like Trinity, Incarnation, that kind of stuff. Opinion? You can disagree. How do you know if something's a dogma? How do you know if it's an opinion? He goes, huh. And six months later, he's Catholic. (laughs) Because only in the Catholic Church can you have a principal basis for making those kind of judgments, right? So that was an apologetical argument to bring a fellow to the faith, help him see clearly through to the question of how do we know the Christian faith? Well, a couple years go by. He and I are taking a trip together, and I say, okay, you've been Catholic now for two or three years. What difference has it made to your life? I thought he would say something about the certainty of faith. He says, you wouldn't believe the difference it made to my marriage because of the purity and the dignity with which I now regard my wife. The power of faith for moral transformation, for the purity of heart. So I found that in the Catholic faith, right? The promise of a humanity reborn. I also found meaning in suffering, an adequate reason, more than adequate, super adequate reason to bear suffering. You know, when I became Catholic, I tried to get my wife on board. She would have nothing to do with it. She says, I grew up Catholic. I left that church. You read about this stuff in books. That's not what Catholics are really like. Go away. Leave me alone. I thought, how can I do this thing? I met Father Angela Shaughnessy. Y'all remember Father Angela Shaughnessy? He used to be out at the network for a while. I said, if anybody can get to my wife, it'll be this fellow. I said, will you go to see Father Angelus? Absolutely not. Leave me alone. I'm not talking to you. And I kept hammering her and hammering her and kind of bugging her. And finally, she says, well, if I'll go once if you'll leave me alone and never ask me again. I say, fine. So she goes. Then she goes back the next week. Then the next week. Then the next week. Then one day I wake up. She's praying the rosary in the middle of the floor at night, and I about fell out of the bed. And I asked her years later, and so long story short, she became a very good Catholic. I said, what did Father Angela say to you? She said something that nobody else had ever said to me before. He said to me, your suffering has meaning. Your suffering has meaning, and she'd had quite a lot of it. So to understand why suffering can have meaning, it's helpful to consider why Christ died. Why did Christ die? You know, Scripture tells us that Christ was obedient. His nobility and holiness was an obedience unto death. Philippians chapter 2 says, because he humbled himself unto death on a cross, therefore God exalted him. There's a nobility in suffering to do good, right? And so it was meritorious. Acts chapter 2 tells us that God rewarded him by pouring out on him the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he then shares with us, meriting for us the grace of redemption and salvation. It's pleasing to God, as it is all of us. When you see someone who suffers for a noble good, we admire them, we recognize that they are intrinsically worthy of reward, all right? First Peter chapter 2, the saint tells us, if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so we're brought into the dynamism of Christ's love and self-sacrifice, especially through the holy sacrifice of the Mass right? And like the Blessed Virgin Mary, we can say, be it done to me according to thy word. In that willing surrender to divine providence, trusting in God's goodness, knowing that he allows everything for a reason, even for our, even our sufferings that we may not understand, if we do so with a good will and faith and trust, is meritorious, is valuable, it's commendable in the sight of God and men. And he will, in fact, reward us. The proof of this is the resurrection of Jesus Scriptures say God gave proof of this to all men by raising Christ from the dead. And so when we encounter sufferings, we can say with the Blessed Virgin, be it done to me according to thy word. Unite them to the suffering of Jesus with confidence that they do have meaning even if we don't see it come to fulfillment in this life. How else could you explain the heroic charity and sacrifice and suffering of a St. Maximilian Kolbe? Reminds me of the language of St. Paul when he says, for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. How could you understand that kind of self-donation apart from the transcendent hope in the meaning of suffering given to us by the gospel? You know, I want to offer you a a very down-to-earth, day-by-day kind of application of this teaching. One of the sufferings that I hear a lot, I experience it, I think we all do, 
is the suffering of regret. We think about our own past misdeeds, things we did wrong, people we may have hurt, mistakes we made, maybe our kids have gone off the rails, they're not doing what they're supposed to, and we're tempted to blame ourselves, blame ourselves, blame ourselves, and beat ourselves up. Kind of desolation, right, in the spiritual life. But you think about it. The gift of forgiveness means our sins have been forgiven. They are gone. Those things in the past stay in the past. They do not come back to us. Our present pains come to us, and the temptation is, I will lose hope. I will beat myself up. I will despair of God's grace because of the pain I experience from my own regret. But faith says, believe that you have been forgiven and that present pains are an occasion of future merits. I will not allow myself to be conquered by my regrets. I will trust that God is bigger than I am. He desires the salvation of my children or my community or the redemption of my life more than I do. And I will make of those pains and sufferings right here and now an opportunity to mortify myself, to submit myself to the will of God, and to grow in holiness. You know, in the secular world, if you go with regret and depression and so forth, they'll, they'll give you cognitive behavioral therapy, which is not bad, how to master your own thoughts and not be mastered by them. But just like that palliative Buddhism, the one thing that can never give you is transcendent meaning in the hope of redemption. One last thing I discovered in the Catholic faith, I discovered that the Catholic faith had saved my reason. You know, I mentioned earlier that in the tradition I grew up in, there was nothing we could do to attain to God or cooperate with God, not in the philosophical realm or the scientific realm or the moral realm. It was just faith alone. And of course, the world thinks that today we see reason itself is, is vacuous and void and we can't even tell the difference between men and women. But the doctrine of the Catholic faith is that reason himself came to restore reason, the incarnation of the Logos, the Word of God. The Imago Dei, the image of God renewed within us, is the image of God's reasonable freedom. St. Thomas Aquinas says, from one point of view, sin itself is nothing more than irrationality, living in a way that's contrary to the good of my nature. The Catholic faith restores confidence in reason that we can actually know what is. Chesterton, of course, a great summarizer of the Catholic faith, said of St. Thomas's philosophy, it's the philosophy that eggs are eggs. And we might also say that women are women and men are men. That's why the pagan philosophers were content to leave the masses in ignorant superstition, but the church fathers wrote a program for fighting superstition, manuals on how to eliminate it. The church is the first institution in civil society to advocate rational rules of civil jurisprudence to fight things like absurdities like the trial by ordeal and institute policies like the reasonable doubt standard. Catholic doctrine on creation laid the groundwork for the scientific revolution. The Dominican theologians at Salamanca developed the theory of human rights. The Jesuits became the great missionaries of science. The glories and the triumphs of reason in the modern world are in fact the gift of Catholicism to world history, the confidence in human reason redeemed by Christ that we really can know that eggs are eggs. Before I had become Catholic, I had lapsed into skepticism. I experimented with that palliative Buddhism. I despaired of moral transformation. And so like many people, I retreated into fantasy and escapism in my own life. You know, I understand that in Denver today, you have a growing population as people are sometimes drawn here for not all the best reasons. Sometimes it's an escape into fantasy escapism, right? You know, new things that are legal on the market in Denver that draw people. Um, but you know, the world doesn't go away. The crisis of meaning doesn't go away when you escape into fantasy or meditative quiescence or, or, the, or the drugged out unconsciousness. The world doesn't go away. Your reason doesn't go away. Your nature doesn't go away. And so by turning to the Catholic faith, God gave me back my wife, my marriage, my reason, and my very self.
Some people think that faith is irrational. But faith is a lot like marriage. It's not irrational of me to believe my wife. I know she loves me. She's proved herself trustworthy over the years. And if she says something to me that maybe I couldn't know just by reason alone, Dave, I need you to pick the kids up after school. I've got no way to independently verify that. But I trust her because she's trustworthy. I entrust myself to her. That's the reasonable thing to do, to have faith in her testimony. How much more so is it reasonable to surrender myself to the testimony of God, who has proven himself true, yes, through the miracles of moving mountains, of transforming societies, of elevating human dignity, of purifying people's hearts, of demonstrating to us his reliability, but ultimately we do have to surrender to God in faith, a faith that transcends what we can know reasonably. No better picture of this, I think, can be found than in the great hymn of St. Thomas Aquinas, Adorote Devote, that line where he says of the Eucharist, seeing, tasting, touching, are indeed deceived. What says trusty hearing? That must be believed. What God's Son hath told me, take for truth I do. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. You know, when I went to communion for the very first time in the Catholic Church, I felt absolutely nothing. But I believed that it was the substantial body and blood of our Lord. Holding to that faith, to the reality of Christ's sacrifice made present to me every day in the Mass, an opportunity to recapitulate that sacrifice in my own life and be reformed in his image and likeness, all of us have the opportunity to grow in that love and charity. You know, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, the Gospel of the sinful woman who anoints the feet of Christ, he says of her, she loved much and therefore is forgiven much. And how did he end with her? Go in peace, he said. Your faith saves you. Thank you very much.